Welcome to Studio 411. I'm your host, Larry De Silva. I appreciate you joining us today. And uh, today we have uh, 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 an excellent guest, uh, someone that uh, that I didn't know personally, but knew knew through other people. And we'll we'll touch on that a little bit later. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, actor, uh, translator, uh, director uh, Kenneth Tiger joining us. Uh, again, you may know Ken from. Uh, uh, as a character actor uh, over the years from uh, many programs. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on a few stories as well as those of you in the Connecticut area, of course, may have seen some of his uh, stage productions over the last uh, few years. Uh, and again, we, uh, we're very happy to have you join us. Kenneth, how are you? I'm fine. It's that's, nice to be here. That's terrific. Um, tell us now, uh, what, uh, what have you been up to over the last uh, few years? I know you were recently uh, uh, over at the uh, uh, Hartford stage, I believe. You're no, doing it. Theater Works. Theater Works, yeah. Doing a, a production. Floyd's Last Stand. Floyd's Last Stand, yeah. And uh, now, were you just this, uh, one of the uh, featured players? or were yeah, you Only actually? two. No, uh, oh, only two, yeah, okay. Um, it's um, uh, Sigmund Freud. I, I grew the beard. Uh, and uh, it, it's terrifying how much uh, I look like Freud uh, when I have the beard on. Um, but it's a two-character play uh, w taking place very late in Freud's life uh, when he, uh, um, and it, it happens the day really that England declares war on Germany, where, where, where the Second World War is beginning. And Freud has already left uh, Austria, and he's he's living in in uh, in London, and he's uh, there's a session with um, I'm I'm blanking on his name, the man who wrote the Narnia uh, uh, chronicles. Uh, oh yeah, I, I, I'm, I can't Any, believe anybody on the I crew throw believe, the I name. I can't believe <laughs> I've forgotten his name. At any rate, um, he the, the two of them come together for a conversation. And um, Freud, of course, was a devout atheist, and this other author was a, a, a true believer. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about the nature of God at a time when Freud is dying of cancer and war is breaking out. And it sounds like a very grim play, but it's very funny. And uh, um, it's a real crowd pleaser. And we had a wonderful time doing it in Harvard. Speaking of funny, and we'll touch on uh, a little bit of your, your stage work, because again, you've, you've been quite uh, busy over these last uh, four decades, if not more, between stage and television and, and doing some movie work. Um, while doing research uh, for the, uh, the interview today, I noticed, uh, again, you, you've done um, uh, a few uh, Arthur Miller productions. And, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I recall uh, reading an interview uh, that you had done that you know uh, Miller was one of the uh, favorite playwrights that uh, whose work you've done. Uh, I uh, love Miller. And yeah. uh, tell us about some of that. I know you did the uh, the Price you did, which actually I've done the Price a, a yeah. bunch of times. And I think you, if I recall, uh, mentioned that that was uh, one of one of his more uh, light or funny uh, plays, at least if I recall correctly. It is. Correctly. It yeah. really is. At and least uh, the character that you would played. Yeah. I've I've pl actually I've played the old furniture seller a couple of times, mm -hmm. and um, and I and I played. The younger brother once I was much I was I was a little bit too old to play the part, but I've loved the play so much that when when it was offered to me, I said absolutely. I'm probably the only person in the world that's played the 90-year-old furniture seller before playing the 60-year-old <laughs> cop. Um, but the furniture seller is a very funny man. I mean, he, it's almost sort of stand-up material, and he comes into this very grim situation. Uh, Arthur Miller mm -hmm. certainly knew how to write drama. And, uh, and it's funny. And uh, you, you get a lot of respect for Miller. He, he was a, a, a true man of the theater. He really understand, he understood drama, he understood people, and he understood comedy. He, yeah. he was funny stuff. I, I have not seen any of his works that I can recall. I mean, I had seen some of his movie or uh, that he did screenplays mm -hmm. for. Uh, the one that's always been the misfits. The misfits. Yeah. Oh, oh, uh, I say always a favorite. It, it's a. Oh, uh, it's a great movie. It, it's kind of a, an odd movie to say it's one of your favorites because yeah. it is. You know, it's not not uh, you know laugh a minute. No, I don't think tough. there's any chuckles it's in tough. it at all. Yeah. And it always had that 
mystique, which, you know, the more I thought about it in recent years that, you know, uh, my, Marilyn Monroe, who was in it, uh, died w within... They all, they all died. Uh, Clark uh, Gable. Al before. Almost all of them except yeah. for... Um, uh, Eli Wallach, Eli Wallach who just was passed the only away, one, yeah. I believe, in 2014 or 2013. Yeah. Montgomery Clift, yeah. it was his last one. Clark yeah. Gable, it was his last one. But even that, you know, I was thinking, and, and also uh, five years later, a Thelma Ritter, who had a brief part, but That's right. uh, to digress for a minute, when she passed, she had been in that John Wayne movie that was... Um, oh, Red River? Th no, the one with uh, where he played Genghis Khan, I want to say, and they filmed it out in the desert oh, in Vegas, oh, in, in Nevada, and they filmed it, I want to say it was probably 55, because I think it came out in 1956. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Agnes Moorhead, John Wayne, Thelma Ritter, and I'm blanking on some of the others, they were doing nuclear tests, and in oh, the case of every right. single one of them, uh, Pedro Armendaz and a few others, all cancer uh, stricken, and they uh, they wow. believe that it was all linked to that. But my point is, Ritter died a few years after that. I believe sure. she passed away about five years. But Miller, you know, certainly had a very long life. He did. Daughter, I believe, still lives around here. Of yeah. course, uh, my wife's all-time favorite actor, Daniel Day Lewis. You know, is, oh. uh, is uh, his son-in-law, if, right. if I'm That's not right. mistaken. But again, so it, it's just interesting how these things kind of weave. But in John Houston, who certainly lived life to the fullest, uh, he lived a long life. So you know, but it was just that mistake. George George Abbott, the writer and director, yeah. directed a Broadway production at the age of 100. Oh, there you go. Yeah. And did he have a theater named after him, or no? I'm, I don't. No, not in no, New York. No. Okay, I, I thought he did, but yeah, and Eli Wallach lived until ninety-eight. So yeah. you know, so again, there are uh, you know people that were not under that so-called misfit curse. But uh, but anyway, it, it just is a good movie, and I, I own a copy, and once in a while I just put it in, and I'm not I'm not saddened when I see it. It just it's kind of just almost like you just sit back and you really. It's a movie that makes you have to listen, and it's a movie that makes you think about, you know, different things. A lot yeah. of lost and souls. That's, yeah. yeah, and that's, uh, uh, I think, w the beauty of uh, plays and stage work mm -hmm. is that if you go there to, you know, kind of, you know, hear a lot of noise, and uh, musicals are great, but I think when they're dramatic plays, like you've done uh, on Golden Pond, All My Sons, which again, I, I recall that, yeah. the movie, Merchant of Venice, Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about the Merchant of Venice. That must have been. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you've done these many times in different. different well, not uh, Merchant of Venice. No. I, I did that in Los Angeles, uh, in a small theater in Los Angeles, and and um, it was an exciting, uh, an exciting production. I come from a, a Jewish background, mm -hmm. and when I was asked to play the part, um, I I leapt at it and I said, "But I'll do it under under two conditions. One." that we not cut it at all. Uh, I, it, we, we, we can't Baudelaireize. And it can't be anti-Semitic. Okay. And I was interested in seeing whether we could do the text as Shakespeare had written it and, and have it uh, come out as, as not an anti-Semitic play, because it sometimes is. Right. And Shylock is, is sometimes is done as a, as a caricature. Um, and uh, it, I didn't want to do that. And it, the more I worked on it, the more I realized, you know, th this is a man whose daughter is stolen from him. And nobody will give him the time of day until they need his money. And he's, he's a man in many ways more sinned against than sinning. And finally he stops. And uh, it, it was very exciting to work on that production. Uh, again, uh, maybe my, my generation more than, than others, again, we always think of, you know, the play. Because, of course, you know, a play makes it to Broadway or in the old days, you know, would play the Schubert in New Haven, kind mm -hmm. of a precursor. You know, that was a big deal. But when you think about it, even a big hit on Broadway could maybe have, you know, several thousand, several hundred thousand people attend. But then if you make a successful movie, now millions are exposed. That's right. It's know. amazing. Yeah. And, and even though I did grow up uh, in Fairfield County, closer to uh, New York, mm -hmm. uh, I was not of the, you know, ability, uh, you know, immigrant parents, whatever they were like, you know, we don't, you know, work, work, work. That's we right. don't, we don't have time to go to Broadway. That's right, yeah, jump on the train. <laughs> exactly, and go to the show. exactly. So, mm -hmm. you know, to, um, you know, to kind of, uh, you know, 
hear about a, a certain play or whatever and then i think to myself like we talked about the misfits or all my sons the merchants of venice i i i thought was that ever made into a motion a major motion picture or no major i don't know no. i'm sure it's been done i'm thinking time. because of the way you talk about the storyline almost might be a little uh, producers might be a little uh gun shy of of uh, it might know. be you know. It might be. And also, it's a very odd play because, you know, we think of it as being um, about Shylock. Um, but in fact, Shylock disappears at the end of the fourth act. Mm. It's a five-act play, and uh, Shakespeare calls it a comedy because at the end, it's the lovers. So one, once that dramatic arc is over, right. you have um, the storyline of who's going to get married. And uh, it, it, it's an odd play, and it would be a very odd play to do for film or television without sort of editing it in a, sure. in a, oh, yeah. in a yeah. Hollywood fashion. Yeah, absolutely, and believe me, they, as you well know, they, they, they will uh, tinker with endings and beginnings. Absolutely. And <laughs> but they, Hollywood is not the only... Uh, no, in, the, no. in the 18th century, uh, it was considered that, that um, some of the great tragedies... Uh, um, uh, Othello, Lear were just too sad, and, and they rewrote them. In the 18th century, Lear didn't die. We're here on Studio 411 with uh, actor uh, and director uh, and also a translator, which we'll, we'll get into that. I was amazed when I was looking on your bio, and I said, they, they mentioned translator right after actor, and I'm thinking, I said, there, there's got to be uh, some juicy stories here, so we'll get into that. But you're watching Studio 411, and uh, uh, from, from that piece of literary work, we'll go to this work here, which uh, was uh, one of Ken's first endeavors, and I, and I bring it uh, not, to, uh, not to embarrass him, perhaps, but because uh, I think that was my first exposure to you. I was going to college in the mid-'70s, and uh, according to this, your screen debut, uh, or, or do we not know what that is? <laughs> are you talking about the Happy Hooker? Yes, we yes. are, yeah. Yes, you played, uh, I'm not even sure, I played Steve. Steve didn't even warn a last name. No, but, no. Uh, but I thought to myself, you know, geez, it's, it's terrible. I said, I saw that movie maybe like on, on a campus of the university I was attending at that time. And I said, I don't recall Ken in it, but uh, there were so many other things going on. Oh, it was a wonderful pr <laughs> picture. It was, I mean, it was Lynn Redgrave. You know, yes, it, wasn't, yeah. it wasn't one of these red light productions. It was a, it was a, um, a very amusing piece. And, and uh, I played a studio executive when Lynn Redgrave came up to do a, um, a striptease on the boardroom table. And uh, uh, Tom Poston I, yeah, I, yeah. was in was in the sequence and uh, uh, George Sons. Uh, it, it was really quite yeah, fun. Yeah, I, I was looking at that and I said, oh, I, I, I said, uh, he's probably going to say, why did you bring that up? And I said, I just couldn't, you know, couldn't uh, let it go. I think, wow, that was, it was a very entertaining movie. And of course, you know, Lynn Redgrave, uh, a fine actress in her She's own right. She's a great actress uh, and a uh, lovely person. Yeah, uh, a lot of TV work, did a lot of Broadway. She, uh, In fact, she was doing a Broadway play okay. at that time. I think she was doing Georgie Girl at okay, the same yeah. time she was shooting the movie. And so she th she had it in the contract that she could get out uh, at night to go and, and do the Broadway wow. play. But she was doing both simultaneously. And, you know, movies, you, you, you wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning, wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning and go and, and you work. And then she'd get off at 6 and run to the theater and do Georgia Girl. And we were shooting uh, that sequence up in Rockefeller Center, mm -hmm. up in one of the very high rooms up in Rockefeller Center because behind the boardroom table uh, there's a window and you see all of Manhattan. It's really quite quite remarkable. And they were setting the lights in there and uh, I came out of a, a holding area where, where I was just sitting waiting to go on and I looked down at the corridor and on the ground Lynn was lying on the ground napping. Wow, I was going to say that's, that's a a major, major load to take uh, to uh, be on a Broadway stage yeah. at night. And of course, because uh, now how would they handle that? Because uh, I'm sure even in those days, I mean, this goes back uh, decades where, uh, isn't there a certain day where they even do two shows? Well, yes, but sometimes uh, the understudy, uh, would, the, the understudy yeah. might go on or they might have been able to work out the schedule so that they could do other scenes that she might right. not have been in. 
right. uh, on, yeah. on so, so, uh, Wednesday. A, a movie to definitely to, to check out via yeah. your, uh, I was going to say your local video store, but that, uh, that's, that's, dating. Still be that's dating me. There's a few still kicking around, but not that many. Um, let's go back a little bit. Uh, tell me about, uh, you, you grew up a Massachusetts native, um, uh, Chelsea, Mass. That's where I was born yeah. and spent most of my formative years in Belmont. Uh, brothers, sisters, no? I have two sisters, okay. both younger. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, I know there was something uh, I read uh, about your mom. What, uh, what did she do for a living? My little? mother was the local rabbi secretary for 30 gotcha. years. Gotcha, that's right, yeah. And my yeah. dad was an electrician. Yeah. And uh, the middle child, my uh, sister is young, uh, closest to me in age, ended up in the theater as well. She was a production stage manager at the Milwaukee Rep. Uh, for a long time, and then she moved to uh, L.A. and was a film editor okay. for a long time. All right. And then uh, you wound up going to uh, Harvard University. You bet. And uh, again, uh, I always uh, can't can't help but think of uh, Charles Emerson Winchester, who always you know always spoke so eloquently about Harvard, Harvard University. Now you went there during the late mid '60s, correct? I was there for all of the '60s. Okay. I, I, I arrived in September of 1960, and then I, I stayed on for an advanced degree, and mm -hmm. I left in 1970. So during that time, with uh, all the um, Turmoil is too strong of a word. No, yeah, it was I, turmoil. I, yeah. You know, in Vietnam, there was yeah. a lot of turmoil. But uh, obviously, in those 10 years, you saw, even even in your own uh, native Boston area, and not to mention nationally, you saw quite a, quite a bit of change. Yeah. Well, the world changed. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think it was just in Boston, just at Harvard. The entire world changed oh, in the 60s. Oh, yeah. absolutely. I mean, yeah. it started off in the early 60s, and it was you know, right after Eisenhower mm -hmm. and, and uh, the, 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 the big um, political organization on campus when I arrived in freshman year was a, a group called Toxin. They were trying to stop the, the proliferation of the bomb. Toxin. Toxin. Okay. <laughs> and that was the only one other than the young Republicans and young Democrats. And by 1970, when I left, of course, there was the SDS and there were all of the, the political organizations that had to do with Vietnam. I mean, Vietnam changed so much. The whole drug culture changed everything. The, the world changed in the 60s. A lot of change in 10 years. They say now, especially from a technological standpoint that things you know change so so much rapidly but i mean yeah. uh, that that stretch there from the 60 to 70 was was quite a uh, quite a good uh, eventful decade it was an know. amazing yeah, time you know and, yeah, and, it was, and i feel very I'm a little to younger but of it. course you know i grew up and and I know uh, was at least fortunate enough that I had parents where they would say, oh, you stay up and watch the news, you know, the the, the, the ten o'clock news, not right. not the eleven. I wasn't up watching Carson, although I wish sometimes I could have. But it just you know, and you'd see all this stuff going on and be like, wow. I mean, of course, even the the nightly news, you know, Walter Cronkite and Huntley Brinkley. I mean, just you know, no matter no matter what what subject what what. Uh, you know, venue, or just the things going on that just uh, amazing, amazing. Um, now, while you were at Harvard, and I'm assuming at this point you were probably getting your, uh, your um, uh, additional degrees, you uh, were in a, uh, a seven-member cast of a, uh, what I was told was a second city like that's right. stage company. That's right. So tell me a little bit about that, a Cambridge oh based though. The, the proposition, it was something like the second city or the committee. It was a, started off as a, a cabaret, m musical, topical, satirical review. And we opened it in the back room of a bakery, in a closed down bakery in Inman Square in Cambridge in February of 1968, and um, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I wanted, uh, I, I was trying desperately to get my degree done. I mean, I, I was working on, uh, uh, on a dissertation. I was getting my PhD in German literature, mm -hmm. and 
I kept getting sucked back into the theater, and I said, "No, that's my hobby. I don't." Because you had started theater like as a young, uh, young teen. For a, a I state started of off when production. I was about twelve years old. Okay, there was yeah. a there was a there was a group in Boston called the Boston Children's Theater, mm -hmm. um, which was an amazing uh, place, and and there was one of the great people in my life was a woman named Adele Fain, and she ran that for many years, and uh, it was one of the only children's theaters in the country that did plays for children, but also by children, and, and all of the plays uh, had kid actors, mm -hmm. and that's where I started that's off. That's where the bug came, and then to get and back I, to And I loved it, but it was just a hobby, and and, uh, and when I got to, uh, to college, I was going to concentrate on my German, and I was going to become a German teacher, and I was going to have a, a sane and normal life, because Nobody goes into the theater. I mean, it never, it never even <laughs> occurred to me that that was something you could do. Uh, and then uh, people kept coming to me and saying, would, would you be in this play? Would you do this? And very often I would say yes. And then when they came to me and asked me whether I would help them open the, 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 uh, the proposition, I said, no, 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 no. And Fred Grandy, uh, who was, uh, played Gopher on the Love Boat, yes. uh, was at Harvard. And he was one of the people who was in the original company. And he was a good friend. And he said, you know, we, we, we really need you to round out the company. I finally said, all right. <laughs> and uh, it took over my life. And uh, I'm going to read a little something. This is from an article that I dug up uh, February 10th, 1969. Uh, no writer attributed at the end. It said Scott W. Jacobs. So we'll assume uh -huh. Mr. Jacobs uh, wrote this. Uh, we'll go to uh, the, the lower end of the article. The seven-member seven cast of the proposition still gets away with its simple stock of Nixon, Agnew, Pot, morality, and sex, especially sex jokes because the little garage theater they occupy in Inman Square is their own unreal world. Uh, they have their own Nixon, Ken Tiger, who <laughs> can bring uh, back our Nixon with only a malaprop, a putty jaw, and seven inflections on the word communist. <laughs> oh, I don't even remember that. Uh, they have, uh, uh, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing the name, Ted Drachman. 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 Sure. Yeah. A... Uh, sloopy shouldered broomstick who can't sing and can't dance and does both well and finally the proposition has a judy kahan Khan, yes. Khan, and fred grandy two very talented people who can do anything and it says the last sentence uh, uh let's see uh, but you don't notice until you've left the theater and your chuckles turn to resonate harvard size ken tiger judy khan and fred grandy are funny and I'm an escapist at heart anyhow. So he certainly endorsed uh, the, uh, the proposition now. Is that, they, they is must that? Have, he must have come one of the nights that, <laughs> that Jane Curtin wasn't on. I was going to say, now Jane Curtin, for those of you old enough to remember the original Saturday Night Live or Kate and Alley, and I believe she's on a series now, if I'm not mistaken. I don't Yeah, I, I believe I, she is. Yeah. I hate to she's say She's been it, in several, yeah. Oh, it's, it's hard to keep television. up, believe me, with yeah. all the cable channels. But she was uh, not, maybe not a founding member, but... No. It, no, as a matter of fact, we gave Jane her first job. Okay. You know, she was, she <clears> was in college, and she lived in the area. And uh, all of a sudden, the proposition took off, and we needed more people because we couldn't... It just took up so much time, and we were all in school and trying to get degrees, and all of a sudden we were at these cabaret. Well, you were doing artists. like Lynn Redgrave, uh, you know, uh, working That's at right. your studies during oh, the yeah. day and then doing theater at I night know. or, or uh, you know, impro improvisation. Now yeah. I look back on it and I think, where did, where did I find all those hours yeah. in the day? Yeah. Um, now, is that theater group still in existence? No. Or? No. Okay. No. Um, it, it was... It, it lasted 10 or 15 years. Um, I was with it for about a year and a half. And then I, it, it really came to the point where I thought, I cannot get my degree and stay in the theater. And so I, I quit the proposition and I wrote my dissertation, got my degree, and then quit German and went back to the theater. Wow. Um, but I, I, had to, I had to do that. Sure. I had to finish it up. Um, no. And after I left, there was always a little bit of improvisation that was uh, part of the proposition uh, performances. Um, and uh, a new director came in and turned it into a completely improvised show. And they, they took it to New York. Um, and it lasted for a while, but it lost a lot of its topical edge. And um, 
you know, with improvisation, you can do improvisation very well. But ultimately, I feel improvisation over a long period of time all begins to look the same mm -hmm. when you're doing it in that kind of a venue. Right, right. Now, um, uh, would you, uh, how would you rate it in terms of, obviously, Jane, uh, from there, did she go on to another type of group, or did she stay with them until she... No, she, she stayed with it, and she went to New York with the group. Okay. And uh, then she made uh, oh, all okay. of those yeah, connections so from many, there. I think, I think she went into Saturday Night Live. Yeah straight from the proposition. Okay. I think it was still running in New York. So many point. of those people, you know, like Gilda Radner and Belushi and yeah. whatever, they either came from uh, National Lampoon or they came from Second City Television. So again, yeah. uh, but uh, quite a, uh, even into the 70s, obviously, and, and Second City continues, but I, I really don't know in, in the Boston area or the cities that you frequent, uh, uh, what kind of impro improvisation is not really... Uh, yeah. What it, what it used you to know, be. You don't, know, I don't follow yeah. it much anymore. But you know, when I was doing it, we were doing a lot of political stuff, a lot of improv, uh, not just the improvisational stuff, a lot of um, topical stuff. It, it, was, it was a period of time when African Americans were just beginning to flex their, their muscles socially. And, and I remember, and, and so uh, it was a time of black power. And we were doing a lot of material about that. And, and it, was, it was both funny and I like to think it was trenchant at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a, uh, a piece called It Came From 125th Street and it was a takeoff on all of the old horror movies sure. and it was a, about you know black people coming out of Harlem and moving into your neighborhood and uh, people got very nervous you know when we were putting it together and said let's just try this out and black people loved it and white people got very nervous you know because <laughs> <laughs> it, it just hit on a lot of the prejudices. So we were doing a lot of that material, and I was writing all of my own Nixon material. Mm -hmm. um, and, and plenty of material that there, there was. <laughs> there was a lot to do at that point. And that was pre-Watergate, so that imagine, sure. imagine that. Well, and the war was sure. going on, so. Joining us here on Studio 411 for the hour is uh, Kenneth Tiger. And again, we uh, appreciate him joining us here for the, uh, the hour that we have together. Um, We'll jump uh, a little bit to uh, some of your um, your television work, um, and actually even the movie work. As I was looking, uh, once I got past the, the memories of the Happy Hooker film, um, I noticed that in looking at your bio, whether you realized it or not, it kind of hit me as I was, you know, doing the research. I said, you know, he plays a lot of a lot of doctors, <laughs> a lot of doctors, a lot of a lot of professors, a lot of uh, people of. Uh, Authority. Have you ever have you ever thought about that when you look back? At oh, the yeah. I'm I'm sort of caught in it now. Part <laughs> of it is because of my age. Um, w when you get to a certain point, you know, you turn on the tube. Everybody's between about 15 and 50, and when you get a little bit beyond that, they don't consider that older people do interesting things like rob banks. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, at a certain point, I've started becoming highly white collar on television. Uh, it's mostly judges and doctors and teachers and that sort of thing. But some of the most interesting things that I've done have been very different. I mean, I remember playing a serial, serial killer on Magnum P.I. and um, things like that. A lot of the Barney Miller things were, were very odd. Uh, but they don't, they don't give those to, to people my age anymore. Uh, I, I get your point, but I, I think, you know, even from what I've seen, some of the work you're doing now, again, I think, you know, uh, I was very impressed, again, for those of you who were more uh, adept at keeping up with the, the local TV guide or the national TV guide, some of the series that uh, Ken is... Uh, has been on lately. Uh, you've been on that new, um, uh, was it, uh, is it Alpha House, the new John Goodman mm -hmm. show, right, which I hear right. great things about. Uh, House of Cards, uh, Elementary, which, uh, mm -hmm. which is doing tremendous. Uh, Nurse Jackie, Broadway, mm -hmm. uh, Broadwalk Empire, and uh, again, and both of those last two playing a dentist, so we can add dentist That's also right. to That's the, right. <laughs> and uh, Boardwalk Empire and Fringe, I left out. So. You know, it's interesting. And Good you, Wife. I've been oh, uh, a judge, uh, judge on Good Wife. Oh, okay. Come there you back go. Every once so in a while. right now it seems like that your stage work and your television work are both uh, are, are both uh, doing uh, quite well. Uh, well, I think so. Yeah. I, it's been very exciting. I mean, I lived in L.A. for about 30 years, and I did very little theater there. Uh, I did... When, when something like Shylock was offered to me, I would do it. But for the most part, I didn't want to 
We, you don't. L.A. is a terrible theater town. Uh, um, forgive me, forgive me, LA, for <laughs> yeah. saying that, but it, it really is true. We'll ship this to a, 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 an access to the station <laughs> in, in Los Angeles, a toot suite, yeah. Um, so uh, you do theater in LA really for your own soul, but you know, not, not to get a lot of I, I read of something because we're, we're uh, a gentleman, uh, you probably haven't worked with him, a writer by trade also does some baseball announcing, Ken Levine, known for oh, Cheers, MASH. He's a, uh -huh. a script writer, a mm -hmm. very talented man. And uh, I was reading, a, he's got a play, I think it's called A or B, question mark, that he has written, mm -hmm. that's playing at a theater in Los Angeles. And I was like, the theater seats 130 people. And I'm thinking, you know, and then as I was reading on, they were talking about how so many of the folks that, that out there do that kind of theater, Again, the, you know, the pay... That's the, the you, only kind of theater. You're doing it for the love of the, of you the do work it for the love because the money is not there. No, yeah. there, and that's good in many ways um, because um, you, can, you can pick and choose the projects that you want to do if, if they're very interesting. And since they're not paying you, if you get a job, you know, to do, you know, whatever television show, um, they call and say, we need you tomorrow. Uh, which is the way it goes, you call the theater and say, I'm sorry, I can't come tomorrow. Right, Somebody's right. actually paying me. Um, that sounds like here. <laughs> <laughs> That's an inside joke for some of our crew, but anyways. So. Um, and, and so you can choose the projects that you want to do. And every, every couple of years in L.A., I would do a project that really was close to my heart and was wonderful, and I loved doing it. And we would do it in a 99-seat theater because after 99 this seat, one, they had to pay you. This one was 130, and uh -huh. I was thinking, you know, and they spoke so eloquently about the theater. And I mm -hmm. thought, oh, well, sounds like a great place for this uh, gentleman or any person yeah. to debut their play. Yeah. And I'm like, 130 seat? I mean, I was just at a venue recently here in Connecticut that is so out of the way that most people don't even know. And it's a 320 seat theater yeah. or, you know, uh, accommodates. Yeah. Uh, and I was like... 130. I said, how do they even uh, break even? <laughs> well, they don't. I mean, it, it, and they can't even fill all of those seats. Right. Um, there are a lot of theaters in L.A., but nobody goes. It's a real driving town. It's not like New York. It's not like here. The culture is very different, mm -hmm. very media-oriented. Um, and um, the theater is not, is not considered as high class there. Uh, at least it wasn't now, 10 years ago when I How would you compare, because I know you've done a few regional things, uh, certainly now many Now that more. I've moved back east, yeah. I've started doing regional But, but even here there. within like the Connecticut area, I mean, uh, what, how would you compare the two in, <clears throat> in terms of uh, um, size of the, the theater? Uh, well, the theaters we have in L.A. Are, are very big. I yeah. mean, the, 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 the equity theaters, the big Mm -hmm. the, uh, even small theaters or equity theaters, the the big commercial theaters, the regional theaters in LA can be very large. Mm -hmm. um, I did a I did a play. The one uh, big contract that I did in in LA shortly after I got there was uh, at South Coast Rep in in Orange County, and it was a big theater. You know, six hundred seats. It's a wonderful theater. Very nice. Uh, stage, lovely people, they do wonderful work. On the other hand, it was an hour's drive every yeah. day, you know, on those freeways. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's more suburban, whereas like right. the, the theater that we were speaking about and I, and I had mentioned also was, I think, you know, right in the heart of L.A., where, sure. again, you know, property, property values necessitate these little little small buildings. Right. You know? uh, what about down, I know you've done quite a bit of theater work in Florida. Uh, how would you uh, compare the two in terms of... Uh, uh, sounds like you've done quite well down there. I know you've got. Well, I've uh, done a couple of plays down yeah. there. I, the um, uh, Banyan Theater in Sarasota mm -hmm. has had me come down in the summer <coughs> a couple Excuse of times me. to do, um, and and uh, that's a wonderful, wonderful theater. They do very exciting work. You know, for a summer theater, they're doing plays like the uh, the Price and Beauty Queen of Lenane and uh, the Drawer Boy and. Uh, um, wonderful, wonderful plays. Um, Florida in the middle of the summer is not my favorite yes, place. Yeah. Um, and then I was down there a couple of years ago in um, Palm Beach um, uh, doing, um, good Lord, oh, uh, All My Sons. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. there you go. 
a wonderful production. Yeah. And, and Who wrote and that, by the way? Arthur Miller. Oh, well, okay. I thought it was, but I wasn't yeah. sure. <laughs> I wanted to hear oh, it. It's a marvelous you. play. It really is a marvelous play, and it talks about all of the, the ghosts that are left over from the Depression and how the Depression marks people. Um, you never get over mm. that kind of thing. We're joined here by actor Kenneth Tiger, joining us for the hour here on Studio 411. Uh, sticking with stage for a little bit, uh, you uh, have on various occasions toured across the country in uh, a one-man show, I Must Be Mr. Boswell. That's uh, right. Tell me now, did you did you I wrote it? that. You did, I was yes. going to say, if you had a hand in that. You wrote it. And, uh, I, it took me a long time. I, I, it's funny, I, I kept thinking, you know, what what is a one-person one play that that I could do. I, I saw Mark Twain Tonight with Hal Holbrook when I was still a teenager. I mean, it, he wasn't actually much older, and it really struck me. I mean, it was great theater, and I had to go backstage, and I met him, and uh, I went into his dressing room, and he, at that point, it, he said it took him three hours just to do the makeup, because he was a young man sure, doing absolutely. old Mark Twain. Now he doesn't have to spend that no, much time. No, and I he, hear he's he's coming out again. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And he's got to be, I believe, isn't he in his mid eighties? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, uh, he's fabulous. Yeah. Out there. So as you said before, we spoke about even earlier off air. Now certain makeup procedures aren't as aren't as uh, you know uh, time consuming That's because right. you know you uh, he's, he's you don't reached need an it. age. Yeah. But right. I actually saw him back in. Um, was it 1967? I want to say that they ran the Mark Twain tonight as mm -hmm. a CBS special. I remember that. that so look how many years ago, yeah. 40, 40 plus years ago, soon to be 50, and yeah. he would have been all of probably not even 40, and yeah, he was right. doing it. Uh, so I was very impressed by that, and I, 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 at a certain point, I started looking for a topic for a one-man show for myself, and I came upon. Uh, James Boswell, who was the biographer of Dr. Johnson mm -hmm. uh, in the 18th century in London. And it sounds like a real sleeper, except that, that Boswell was uh, a very interesting man. I mean, he, he uh, would go off into the parks and find women and have sex in London in public in the parks. And I mean, that's that's just a good lead in. <laughs> he knew everybody. I mean, knew Johnson, knew all of the important people uh, of the day. And uh, he, was, he was considered sort of a fool by people who knew him. Um, but he, he wrote what is arguably the first modern biography in the English language. And I found him, and they had just discovered a lot of his, his diaries that he kept, and he was, he was very open. He wrote everything down, and uh, the, uh, a lot of the diaries had been probably hidden by the family for 120 years, wow. and they had, they had been discovered. And I took a lot of that material, and I turned it into a one-person play. And right at that time, the entire um, theater um, form of the one-man show changed. And instead of doing things like Mark Twain Tonight, uh, or there was one on Churchill that an Englishman did, uh, um, nobody was doing that anymore. Right. And the one the one person play now tends to be a memoir about uh, how I was abused by my parents, or um, what it was like growing up gay and not being able to tell anybody, and uh, you know being a black person in the South. That's what the one person play right, is now. And right. I'm sorry, I didn't have anything to tell like sure, that. No, I hear, I hear there's there's uh, on that same topic. I don't know if it's going to be a good production, but I know. Uh, a local um, regional theater here in this area is uh, trying to get a, uh, a one, I think it's a one man Dickens uh, uh, production uh -huh. here. So it'd be interesting to see and coming from England. So really? I think it's just a matter of getting, you know, whatever the, the financing or the sponsoring sure. to, uh, sure. you know, to bring that person. But again, in terms of uh, cost or it whatever, from. it's really not certainly a lot, lot uh, easier to stage a production uh, such as that as opposed to having a, you know, grandiose, uh, you know, production where you've got, you know, 50 or 100 sure. people. You know, and sure. Well, I could travel with the Boswell, but there wasn't a lot of market for it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, oddly enough, Johnson uh, isn't really considered a major figure that they read in, in even in college English classes anymore. Um, the, the 18th century, well, it's a long time ago. And, and even though 
uh, in many ways it's the beginning of modern English literature. The first novels were being written at that point. Um, it, the wigs and the finery, people think of it as being very uh, difficult to to get in touch with and and, uh, and when you do see again a, a movie more so than a, a theatrical play I'm trying to think there was one with uh, Glenn Close, Close and I think Michelle Pfeiffer uh, about 15 20 years ago that reminded me John Malkovich was in it as oh, well. Oh oh yes it was, it, it was a dangerous Le liaison. liaison dangereuse. Yes yeah yes, and again marvelous. but those are usually again they, they have a lot of backing or they are these they, you know they're very expensive uh, they're, they're uh, these artsy movies that sure. you know again the uh, uh, you see in art houses and then you know w my wife and I recently we read a, a great review about a movie I believe I'm sure it's not the name of the, the movie but I think it was called Drumstick but I could be wrong and Paul Reiser's in it and a few other people and this young man who actually learned how to play the drums in uh, in you know an actor you mm -hmm. know which is a remarkable you know. but the point is is that we keep looking and it's like these movies come on I'm like how do they make any money you 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 can't see it around here you know you have to yeah. wait for it to, or go into New York or to Boston or, or LA to see these movies because they have such limited release it's it's a miracle how they even break even. well if they can do it for a, a small enough amount of money they make the money on the ancillary um, the DVD or this now the streaming sure, sure. and all of that and they're, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there. They make it from the, the television rights and, and uh, which thank God the they have all these, you know, these avenues to try to recoup. Right. And even then, so many movies, you know, don't don't make the money. Uh, let me touch base uh, again uh, in the time we have left. Um, you were in uh, two or three of the Lethal Weapon movies. Two. Two. Okay. I'm uh, in two and two and, and three. Two and three. And and uh, and while I was doing that, and uh, I was surprised to, to see, and I don't know if you had any scenes with her because I don't presume to know how a production like that is staged out over, let's say, a six-week, eight-week period. You may not see a particular person who's in the movie. You may not have any scenes, so you may not have even uh, right. exchange pleasantries. But I was looking, and I saw. Gee, do you recall who played Danny Glover's wife in the movie? No. Okay, I, I had a, uh, the uh, pleasure of meeting her at a, for a charity uh, work that uh, we sometimes do. Uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, Darlene Love, oh played Danny That's Glover's exactly. wife. And I'm looking at this and I'm saying in all four movies. And I was like, I had no idea that she even was in acting. I know yeah. she's been in a movie that uh, this last year that got some good praise about the, uh, uh, the singers in the 60s, those uh -huh. that sometimes... You knew their voice, but you didn't know the story about them right, and right. stuff. And she's, you know, she's had quite an interesting up and down career. Yeah. But I was like, wow. I said, so I'm looking at this. I'm saying, so obviously you, you had no well, idea. Well, I worked with Danny. I worked yeah, with Mel, yeah, but exactly. I didn't work with her. Oh, yeah, because the scenes for the, uh, I know I saw the first one, which you were not in. But, no. of course, you know, the, the, you know the, everything was shoot them up and, you know, the buddy movie. That's basically well, what it yes, was. Well, yes, but there was, there was a lot more to the first one, which, which I think, <clears throat> I, I think the first one's a really a great movie yeah. in many ways. Gary uh, Busey uh, was in it. It was, uh, you know, played. Uh, it was one of the first movies that I know of where a, a, a black family served as a role model for a white person. Um, you know, when you think about it, that was very unusual at that point. Um, and uh, the, um, the script is really quite marvelous. Mm -hmm. And with, with Mel playing somebody who's really crazy, having a very difficult time, and then finding uh, solidity mm -hmm. and some kind of m moral center uh, in an African American family, uh, I think it's quite quite terrific. Unfortunately, by the time the fourth one came, which again you were not in that one, but then it became this like you know uh, extravaganza. Well, that's what uh, happened. You know, Joe Pesci, Chris Rock. I mean, sure. it just became you know this. Let's let's see how high we can get the budget, and yeah. I think the quality, you know, was certainly storylines and. Again, it, what I always look for when I see a sequel, and there's very few that I will see, because if I don't see the original, then, you know, you almost feel like, you know, you can't get yeah. get caught up. Like people said, oh, you never saw Harry Potter? Yeah. I didn't see the first one. Why am I going to go see number seven? Yeah. You know, that's yeah. just me. You know, or if I saw Rocky or Superman or many of the others, you know, you might be able to get away with it. But some of these things, you know, you have to know what's going on with the story. Right. And, uh, you know, but by the time they get the, 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 the movies get, uh, 
you know, shorter and shorter and shorter. It's like, what, we, we can't come up with any ideas to fill the two hours, you know? Well, there they, are only a certain a small number of original plots. And yeah, oh yeah. Everything well, else is even, just icing even on in, the cake. Even in television, I sure. uh, just read an article where now, you know, they're, they're constantly recycling old ideas. They're sure. bringing back the odd couple, which I love the original. Yeah. But in, most people don't even remember there was a there was, was a, a play a, Afri a play and a great movie too. But actually, let me see. The play was uh, uh, my goodness, Art Carney, and uh, I'm trying to think who else I don't was, in who was in was it. Was it might have been Walter Matthau? I forget. And then, I don't think Matthau did the original. No, production. then yeah. But I thought Art Carney was in it, and then the movie, of course, Jack Lemmon, Walter Matthau, and then yeah. Tony Randall. Um, um, uh, Jack Klugman. And right. what a segue I've got. Then the 80s version, which happened during a writer's strike, so what they did, they recycled some of the old episodes, which mm -hmm. is a mistake, was with Damon Wilson from Sanford and Son and one of your old friends from many moons ago, Ron Glass. Oh my God, Ron. So the obligatory we have to, I said, I'm going to try to keep it short. I love the show, but I said, the, the man must be <laughs> tired of talking about Barney Miller. And again, you... Who could get tired yeah, of talking a, about Barney Miller? It's a great Miller. program, and it's on, it's on uh, one of the cable channels, and I'm blanking on it what it is. It might be... Um, oh, I'm, I'm like you now. I can't think of the, uh, the answer, but it'll come to me. Uh, Gary Owens does the... Oh, well, uh, I thought of... I thought of C.S. Lewis. He's the one who wrote C.S. Lewis, yes. At least I, I've got, I picked yeah. that one up. Yeah, know, we now. can roll the tape back and insert that answer into C.S. Lewis and Sigmund Freud. I'll have, to, right. I'll have to look that up. Very good. But now, Barney Miller, you played six, uh, six or seven appearances on that program. Uh, six, technically, but there was, a, there was a seventh there when um, uh, Jack... Sue died. Yes. Uh, they did a memorial. Ah, there and they we go. used some of my material in that. So. And on there, you, uh, you did a great role. And of course, you know, this was years ago, and I, I probably saw it when it originally aired, where you played a, uh, a werewolf or a man yep. who thought, <laughs> what, had he gotten bitten? Or what was the, what was the story? We like? never really got into the, the back story. <laughs> but, uh, uh, it, was a, it, it was a very interesting episode uh, because. Um, you do, I do turn into a werewolf at the end of the, it was, uh, the it episode, was quite but, amazing. but there's no, there's no makeup. Exactly. And, yeah. and um, Danny Arnold, who was the executive producer and the, the creator of that show, one of the real geniuses of Hollywood. Um, and uh, when he asked me to do it, um, I was told that the idea was to do it like Ionesco's play, The Rhinoceros, where somebody turns into a rhinoceros on stage, but um, Zero Mostel, I think, uh, did You it just in, read in my York. mind. I was going to tell you that. <clears throat> uh, yeah. but, but he doesn't really. I mean, there's no rhinoceros suit or anything like that. But if you do it with enough conviction, everybody sees a rhinoceros. And that was the idea of doing the werewolf. And, and it was great fun getting into that and, and working on it. And, and Now, in those days, uh, uh, no live audience? I know some of the early shows, uh, they say, were a live audience. Some of them were. But the, then it became very difficult. Cause that was the, the second episode that I did. The okay. first one, we did a live audience. Uh, I played a man who had been mugged by a little old lady. And, um, and then came the werewolf. And at that point, one of the reasons that Barney Miller was so good was that they, they worked with a very small stable of writers. Danny worked on it. Um, the the um, werewolf was uh, Reinhold Wiggy uh, did that. He's the, he went on the to do Night Court. Night Court, among other things. Uh, yeah. And uh, there, there were just a very few people who wrote the show. And because of that, they were always late with the episode, with the script. The first rehearsal that we did of the of the the werewolf, they didn't have the second act of it. They hadn't been written. They knew what it was going to be, but they didn't have the script written. So by the time we we got to the production date, um, we had the full script, but we hadn't had a chance to rehearse the whole thing in front of the cameras. So that when they brought in the studio audience, we were able to do the first half of the show in right. front of the studio audience. We did the second half of the show for the studio audience, but the cameras weren't working oh, okay. because they, didn't, they hadn't rehearsed it with the cameras. By the third episode, they'd done away with the studio yeah, audience. It's, which I, I just learned recently. I you know, didn't realize, but I got the impression that 
throughout the series the you know the long hours and again when it you do that you can't hours. hold an audience hostage for no, 12 I mean, hours I, I remember when we finally finished uh, the werewolf who uh shooting that that evening it was like three in the morning yeah and uh i'm thinking as you're saying this to me that the the time you spent at the proposition in cambridge really paid dividends because obviously you were able to do a little improv improvisation and i think from what i read that they told you what the character was about and then kind of gave you a little leeway to kind of make it your own. Well, th the lines were theirs. I mean, I, d I didn't, I wouldn't have presumed to write mm -hmm. anything for them because their scripts were really so brilliant. But then when they say, you know, you, you start turning into a werewolf, well, th that, you know, <laughs> they don't give you the lines, yeah. you know, you, you howl, <laughs> well, you, you, how do you do it? And that's up to you to come up with. There's probably, I don't know if it was at the end of the episode, but probably in the middle of the, the time in the cell, for those of you, Barney Miller was, was a set in a police precinct where you literally look like you climbed onto the cell and let out with a bay. That, I, was, know, I was, I was <laughs> holding, <laughs> holding on to the cell doors. The cell doors are now, I believe, in the Smithsonian. Oh, anyway. okay, there you go. So and the, the last, you... the last uh, episode that I did, they've, they've brought the, the man, the wolfman back, mm -hmm. uh, except that at that point, uh, I, I was no longer a werewolf. Oh, okay. um, I had been cured, and now I was uh, possessed. And um, uh, probably uh, around the time the Exorcist came out. So they were gonna and they, they left me in this. They, they they were working on a different scene, and I uh, I I'd done what six of their shows, and this was five of them. I'd been in the cell, and I was thinking, what can I do that I, that I've never done before in here? Because the cell is very small. Sure. Oh, and, yeah. And you know what can you do? And I I was playing around in there, and I I got on the on the the cell door, and I I managed to get myself flipped over so that I was holding on to the door and I was upside down and right at that moment by pure chance Danny walked through and he looked at it and he said that's great all right so now let's do and uh, all of a sudden they brought in a trampoline for me and so I, w I was able to do jumps that were you know 10 feet high and going out it was it was great fun working with those people. And I think uh, I know the the this, the entire series is on DVD, and they don't they don't need a plug from me. But believe me, I can recall many a time when it ran originally uh, back in the what late seventies, early 70s, to mid eighties yeah. on ABC. It was you know it was quite a quite a show. But yeah. uh, again, all you have to do is with all these retro channels and retro movie channels. I've got a list here that I couldn't read if I was trying to recite the alphabet. You've got Charlie's Angels, The Waltons, which uh, you can catch on uh, one of the uh, local uh, cable channels. Heart to Heart, Hill Street Blues, you spoke about Magnum P.I., uh, Star Trek Voyager. I think, did you do one or two of the Star Trek I series? did one Voyager and I did uh, ne uh, an episode of Next Generation. Gotcha. Uh, West Wing, we didn't even talk about. You mm. had two years you were on a show called... L.A. Heat, which uh, maybe we'll touch on, because I wasn't even aware of the show, to be honest. Well, that was a cable show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my parents used to say, geez, Larry's not even in the house. The TV's already on. So that shows how much TV I watched. Kenneth Tiger, we appreciate you coming down to uh, see us and spend the hour with us. My pleasure. And we uh, hope to see you again uh, when you uh, are in the area, uh, especially with some uh, stage and theatrical productions. Go see him, and uh, maybe he'll bring uh, I Must Be Mr. Boswell to the, uh, to the area. Uh, Larry De Silva, Studio 411 is the program. We hope you have enjoyed the hour, and we will see you again uh, next time. Take care now.